You can start with the first uh, screen as well. You can start with the first uh, screen. If everybody can mute uh, when uh, mute when one person is uh, speaking, that way there is no echo. But I think we are live. I will just uh, so we will first introduce uh, the panel. If you can go to the former slide. Echo, but I think we are live. I will just uh, okay. So we will first introduce uh, the panel. I will still put my headphones just to make sure there is no echo. Yeah, that's the universe just coming together for this uh, wonderful event. Um, so thanks everybody uh, for the financial future we want. Uh, so today we will go through uh, a wonderful uh, panel. So basically, thank you everybody. So if everybody can mute themselves so there is no uh, echo, that'd be great. Today, I'm your host, Thierry Arisuiz. I'm the CEO and founder of AGAO, AGAU, uh, one token backed by silver, one token backed by gold. But in this particular setup, I will be actually representing the AIER, uh, the American Institute for Economic Research, uh, more particularly the Bastia Society of Switzerland. And uh, joining us uh, today, we have Michel Girardin, uh, who's an economist and lecturer uh, in macrofinance at the University of Geneva. We also have uh, Sabine uh, Schlorke, who is um, the, I still have an echo, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so she, I'm, I'm gonna just uh, go through it. So she's the managing uh, global manufacturing and global trade at, uh, I'm having an echo. Everybody else has an echo as well, or no? Okay, so it's probably me. No, no echo for me. Uh, so, uh, so, so, sorry, I will start again. So I'm Thierry Arisuiz. We've introduced uh, Michel Jordan. Uh, with us also is Sabine Schlocker, who is uh, managing uh, global manufacturing and global trade uh, supplier at the IFC. We have Marie uh, Owen Thompson who is the head and global trend uh, and sustainability at Global Routier Investment Solutions. And finally, uh, Peteris Zilgarvis, uh, who is uh, the digital innovation and uh, blockchain uh, expert, uh, also the co-chair of the FinTech Task Force at the European Commission. Uh, with this, I'm going to go through a brief disclaimer. Uh, basically saying that uh, the people on this panel uh, are, are going to make uh, statements that represent only their own and not their institutions. So this event is for entertainment purposes uh, and informational purposes, I hope, uh, uh, only. But uh, so we do not have a real-time fact check. So uh, we, we, we cannot uh, check that whatever sentences we're saying uh, represents uh, the truth. Okay, so uh, to start with, um, I'm going to have um, a very quickly uh, a first uh, statement. My statement is simple. Uh, we're all here for one thing, which is uh, to uh, elaborate on the financial future we want, and more particularly in this setup, to uh, know how we can make a more inclusive and a more transparent financial system. Uh, we have a setup where we have academia represented, uh, private sector, uh, public, uh, and also uh, 
civil society. So if I may, I will start uh, asking you basically to introduce yourself a little bit further and also tell us what you are doing and uh, what are your thoughts about uh, how we can make an inclusive and transparent financial system for everybody. So maybe Sabine, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you, Thierry. Um, so I'd like to introduce myself as uh, being a manager for manufacturing and also supply chain financing in the International Finance Corporation, uh, which is part of the World Bank Group. So as such, it is a development institution and our objective is to uh, erase poverty and increase prosperity in emerging markets. So as such, I see financing as a tool uh, that we are using uh, in uh, the International Finance Corporation works with the private sector and it is the tool to improve people's lives and to achieve our objectives. So in the manufacturing space, I use the financing, long-term financing, equity financing, short-term financing is being used to align with private sector companies uh, to help us achieving our objectives. Uh, I see a lot of change in financing. Um, this is where my short-term experience comes in, the short-term financing experience with digital developments that allow us to go much more directly <clears throat> to our target companies and uh, to, uh, I think, to introduce transparency and data, big data that have not been there before. So as such, I'm very curious to hear what this discussion brings and I'm happy to participate. Thank you, Sabine. Uh, I would like to hand it over to uh, Mario and uh, Thompson at uh, Lombardier. Uh, what is Lombardier uh, doing? What are your activities? And uh, how do you think uh, we can uh, have a better inclusive and transparent financial system? Right. So um, hello, everybody. <laughs> Delighted to be here with uh, you all. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, Lombardier is a private bank uh, here in Geneva, in, uh, in Switzerland. And um, of course, uh, we have a fiduciary duty to try to preserve uh, our clients' wealth and hopefully improve upon it which uh, in extension obviously means that we have to be fully engaged in how the world develops. And uh, we firmly believe that, uh, that uh, an economy that is sustainable and inclusive is the kind of economy that um, will also deliver the best results for, our, uh, for, our, for the clients in our bank as well as uh, for the world uh, as a whole. So my role in this activity is that I'm an economist by training and, um, and I am in charge uh, of global trends and sustainability uh, at Lombardier uh, for the private bank. Thank you. Uh, Michel, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your activities? Yes, uh, good morning uh, or good evening. I don't know where people are based uh, listening to us anyway. Uh, very happy to be here with you. And um, so, yes, I have a bit of a similar background to Mary. I'm also an economist by training, and I've worked for many years as a chief economist in the banking sector, um, doing macro finance, not to be confused with micro finance, which is usually more known. So macroeconomic trends as applied to financial markets. And for the last 10 years now, I moved into academia. I still have a few mandates uh, where I provide advice to asset management and wealth management companies and pension funds. Uh, but basically, my job now is to do uh, uh, empirical research uh, and uh, also do what Mary does, identifying global trends. Done some uh, research now on debt sustainability, which is uh, very much to the point uh, dealing with post pandemic uh, trends. And also on blockchain and crypto assets. And uh, all this uh, I found very interesting given the themes that we are interested in here in this uh, vision of financial future namely inclusiveness, uh, transparency, and I would add also sustainability. Okay, thanks. And uh, Petris, how does the uh, European Commission uh, looks at uh, transparency and inclusion of the financial system? Definitely, these are some of our main aims. 
Um, as you mentioned, I'm co-chair of the FinTech Task Force, which cuts all across the European Commission. And we've had a FinTech action plan, as well as a digital finance package, which aim at innovation, transparency, and inclusion, among other things, also financial stability, obviously, and a uh, capital markets union. But in the financial markets, we think that uh, many of the new technologies, specifically distributed ledger technologies, blockchain, um, artificial intelligence, can help to make the uh, finance system more competitive, more open, and more inclusive, because we know that even in Europe, there are people who are not able to access the full panoply of banking and financial sector services and elsewhere in the world, because we are also multilateralists, convinced multilateralists, and myself, among other places, have been at the, have been at the World Bank, so the World Bank Group, and who we met with actually yesterday in a coordination meeting. And also in our own actions uh, in a European blockchain observatory and forum and a European uh, blockchain partnership building a blockchain services infrastructure, which includes a regulatory sandbox. We are again aiming at this competitive, open, innovative set of sectors, not only the financial sector, but that really put the citizen at the center. And this is the advantage, obviously, of a digital approach that the citizen can be at the center and not being having to go between many different windows or many different institutions can really be at the center of the services and utilize the possibilities like digital assets, smart contracts, um, central bank digital currencies in, in the future that make them have more access to financial services, whether that to be for their SME, their small and medium enterprise, for their startup, for them just as a consumer, or obviously also for corporates or for people who are retired and perhaps not active in the economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. So you, you talked about uh, uh, the World Bank and I want to The profit, the profit for, uh, the profit for all. How can we make profit uh, in a capitalist system, but that that profit is incentivized into doing good, right? Uh, and in that context, uh, I want to uh, give a little bit of time to uh, Sabine uh, on a question uh, that has popped out, which is how can financing uh, incentivize better environmental and social practices, and in this in this particular uh, case, what are the benefits of uh, financial, uh, uh, you know, of financial digitalization of supply chains? Maybe since you are an expert in that, but more importantly, what is the role of international financial institutions like the IFC, um, you know, the International uh, Finance Corporation? How 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 do you actively uh, help tackling this problem? Uh, it's, it's a broad question. It's, a, it's, a, it's very wide to answer. Um, I think there's a carrot and a stick approach and financing is always used as a tool. So I think a very big stick is just not to finance <laughs> certain activities, right? It's a big stick. And uh, I think that is coming out again and again. The World Bank Group just comes out with this uh, uh, climate uh, action plan and there's very clear there's a red zone where financing is just not going to happen. And I think this uh, is, I think the pressure on the financial sector is increasingly uh, going into the stick approach. What is more difficult is to develop a carrot <laughs> and uh, to promote sustainability and promote uh, behavior um, that we would all like to see and help the private sector to to achieve the objectives that are being set through uh, transparency, digital system, sustainability. There's a lot of things that we would like to see in many value chains and financing can be a very useful tool to achieving that. So in our, in our supplier finance, what we have achieved is that we are looking at larger companies that we're working with, uh, who are the buyers of receivables and we're looking into their systems that we're clearing our, under our environmental and social performance standards. So we're looking at the large companies and we're clearing their systems under our performance standards, which means we're looking into their supply chains. We look into how they work with the, uh, their suppliers to assure 
labor standards to assure environmental standards and other objectives that we see in sustainability. And we have very clear performance standards in the International Finance Corporation that we, what we would expect companies that we are working with to achieve. And then we look and work with the buyers to see of what are their systems of how they're ranking their uh, suppliers. And then the buyers themselves put in carrots and say, if suppliers be, uh, perform better under our standards, they have rating systems for their suppliers, they get a lower price. So they can get an incentive to perform better through financing. This is all enabled because you know, we do have digital platforms that allow us to see every single transaction that is happening. Um, we know every single receivable that's being financed and we know exactly where it's coming from. So that is, I think this is where technology comes in, where digitization comes in and where we are working with FinTech platforms. It's a re re and FinTech platforms can be banks, right? They have their own platforms but this cannot, this can be non, this can be just financial uh, platforms that allow us. And sometimes these platforms are even in the real sector companies that allow us to do the connection from the buyer directly to the supplier from the purchase order to the delivery of the product to um, then paying the bill finally by the uh, buyer. It's a very interesting way of doing it and it's incentivizing, uh, I think, good behavior in the supply chain and achieving objectives. And a lot of the large companies make sustainability promises, increasingly so, um, about water use, about uh, CO2 emissions, and they go beyond the scope one and scope two, they go also into scope three. And that is becoming very interesting and allows uh, opportunities in, um, using the financial systems to achieve these objectives, but also to increase transparency. Uh, that I think is very important to allow, of, to, to, to see of who are the suppliers, what are the interactions and how are these uh, value chains connected? The, the, the sticky and the carrot is, is definitely something that uh, comes uh, a lot. Uh, so Marie, we were discussing that previously, uh, you know, do, do you have blacklists of certain companies that are engaged in certain uh, behaviors that you would not uh, uh, finance? Uh, or do you have uh, green ones where you just uh, want to finance more? Uh, I, I imagine there is clients who come to you with a, with a different mandate and that uh, care more or less uh, or believe more or less in certain standards. Uh, how do you how do you handle that uh, at Lumba with you? Right. So that's obviously a, a sustainability question. Yeah, and and of course we do have a, an exclusion policy uh, and uh, the activity of sustainability also involves stewardship, which is engagement and voting uh, with companies directly, and uh, and of course we have. Uh, many ways uh, that we assess the greenness, perhaps, of products that we propose to our clients. And, uh, and, and I don't want to take up too much time with explaining that process, but uh, this is uh, definitely uh, a core conviction uh, at uh, our bank that, uh, uh, that this monumental change that the world economy is experiencing at the moment is... Uh, uh, not only a threat, but a great opportunity and a fantastic uh, investment opportunity. Uh, so, so that's uh, what I would like to say about that. And now, if I may, I, I would just <clears throat> want to point out, of course, that the people who are uh, usually excluded from financial services do not tend to be our clients, right? And uh, unfortunately, there's uh, as many as 1.7 billion of them today who are excluded from financial services. And uh, 1 billion of those 1.7 billion are women. Yeah. So this, I think, is uh, uh, obviously uh, needs to be changed. This needs, this has to change. And, um, and the interesting, I mean, you know, amongst uh, many other important facts, but of course, these people who tend to be excluded from financial services live in developing countries, so live uh, already in lesser income countries, and they tend to be the lesser income people in those lesser income countries. And uh, often they are also uh, less educated and uh, often, of course, uh, excluded also from the labor market. So in terms of aid and effort, of course, if we can improve people's incomes uh, and, uh, 
and education levels and improve access to the job market, we would uh, also improve financial inclusion. But it also works the other way around. And this is what I think is really interesting, that there are uh, many studies that show that if you uh, help primarily women uh, with giving them financial access, you, you actually improve uh, all of these things um, uh, so so they become less poor, they save more money, and they have greater access to, to jobs and, uh, and education and, and relative, you know, improved uh, living conditions. So, so that I think is an interesting uh, interaction. And therefore, uh, clearly, what we want from this uh, future, financial future of ours is absolutely more transparency, the more information we have, the better it is for everybody, there's no doubt. Uh, but we also need to provide these financial services cheaper, faster, and better. That's uh, my profound conviction on that. I, I'm going, th thank you, Marie. You, you made me think about a lot of things, but I'm going to take the hat of the hardcore libertarian, uh, taking the hat of the Bastia society, right? Um, I think there is two uh, things that I was looking at. The first one is I think you are right when you say that uh, you know there is problems, particularly in the inclusion of women, and there is more and more research and evidence saying that uh, the more inclusive you are, the more it is beneficial actually for corporations or for uh, or globally. So I think uh, when there is a market for it, and when doing good basically brings you more profit. Uh, that is uh, something that naturally uh, you would do. Um, now, taking into account the word inclusiveness, right? I, I kind of frame it this way because we are talking about inclusion, but when we are deciding that some companies will not be financed and some companies will be financed, the question a libertarian would say is who are the angels who are going to decide the winners and losers? Who are the angels uh, who will decide what is good and what is wrong, and should there be any angels as such? So I'd I want to provoke a little bit the thought, because I think Pateris probably has something to say about that. But before we go there, uh, Michel, what, what do you think? Should there be any angels deciding what is right and what is wrong in terms of the carrot and the stick? <laughs> good or evil? Um, mm -hmm. Um, I have to think about this this one. Uh, but first, let me go back to the the, the themes of uh, inclusiveness and transparency. And uh, actually, uh, when you define the word inclusive, um, you find that the definition is providing equal access to and opportun to opportunities and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. And here we can think of two kinds of uh, exclusions, which Mary linked uh, when she mentioned the 1.7 billion people who are excluded from financial services. And out of that, we have a large proportion of women. Because today, when we talk about inclusion, we generally think I'm going to participate uh, in June to the Career Women Forum. And in there, they also talk about inclusion, but they talk mainly about uh, uh, or exclusion, uh, so women uh, inclusion, highlighting, for instance, what we spoke here, that if we, you include 30% women in the senior management or board level in companies, then studies, academic studies show that uh, uh, these firms produce um, uh, better, better results. So, uh, Yes, there are these two kind of uh, exclusion that we need to address uh, when we talk about inclusiveness. Um, for myself, when I look at uh, uh, the trends, mega trends that we are currently facing like blockchain um, and the words toward the, a digital economy, uh, it's certainly, uh, if we need to just think of inclusiveness, then for me, it's a double plus. It's a plus plus using uh, digitalizations to provide financial services to people, especially in the developed countries that may not have access otherwise 
to ways, safe ways to, to save money and, and transport money and, and not be attacked. You know, if you think of uh, 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 people uh, selling uh, uh, agricultural goods in, in Africa and having to, uh, uh, um, you know, travel, uh, uh, walk for hours before they can sell their merchandise and then they get cash and they get robbed. And so a way to use their phone and provide digital services for them, it's clearly a, a big plus. Uh, but when we deal with transparency, and blockchain, you know, we're given uh, this idea that uh, blockchain, all the crypto assets improve transparency because everything is out there. But we have a problem here. There is transparency, but there is also anonymity. And there are ways if you go on the, on, on, on if you Google uh, blockchain transparency anon anonymity, you will find that there are lots of uh, uh, tools that are given to the people who use crypto assets to anonymize their transactions and to escape, to get out of the radars and to transfer Bitcoins into uh, XMR, you know, uh, um, uh, what's that, Monero uh, currency, and then go back to Bitcoin and then your Bitcoin's holdings are completely anonymous. This is why they're used by hackers. This is why they're used by criminals. So here we really need, here it's not a double plus as uh, when we're dealing with transparency and digitalization of the world, we clearly need to address this problem of having a potentially transparent system, but that allows anonymity. And in that is not uh, ideally uh, transparent. Thank you, uh, Michel. Uh, I, I don't know if you dodged the question or if you just had so much to say that you said what you thought was more important. So we'll get back to it. But, uh, <laughs> the angel, but, yes. but, be, <laughs> but before that, um, I, I want to I want to I want to put the gear back a little bit to that, uh, because we also have a, a question that goes along that line, uh, which is how do we balance the inclusion of financing requirements? Uh, OK, so. What I mean by that is, particularly for those poorer countries, when you establish a standard, it always puts a level of standard and a barrier for entry. The more standards you have, the more compliance you have to do. And then sometimes the, that puts you out of the market because you cannot go into that activity. And so if the standard and the bar is too high, doesn't it actually remove the potential for inclusion? And that's the question from uh, Brad DeVos, who is a director at the AIER. Um, he says, for example, what if a mining company is the, in, in developing countries can't meet such a first world standard? Wouldn't financing them help the grow and become more efficient, i.e. sustainable in the future? So uh, maybe we can join that question to, to the angel story. And, and if Pateris, you can, you can give us your opinion about it. Uh, I'd be happy to hear. Well, I just say now we're in angels and, and financing and, and coming together. Well, I mean, obviously we in the European Union are, are a market economy. Um, so obviously a free market, sometimes described as, as a social market economy. And I, I didn't mention at the beginning, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. My doctorate is, is in law, so I'm not uh, among the economists here. Um, but I, I have done uh, various reading in the economic field, uh, Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, Theory of Moral Sentiments, uh, Schumpeter, Can Capitalism Survive? And I mean, some of the things that you do see, if you want a flourishing market economy, you need certain prerequisites like a rule of law. It, ex it helps to have an excellent education system. We see an innovation, universities with tech transfer into the economy, a monetary and financial stability. So, I mean, I think there is a, a strong role for the state. And in the area where I work most of all, the internet probably wouldn't happen have happened without uh, DARPA and the strong intervention of, of the US government. And those who know the history, uh, there was also a, a French national um, initiative, uh, the Minitel, um, which wasn't as good as, as the internet, 
But again, I mean, if uh, it had been the only thing out there, it might have uh, become the, the dominant network in the world. Um, but in any case, they were both uh, investments that were coming from the side of, of governments, as is much of the history of venture capital in the, in the US. If you play, read another book, I can mention uh, venture capital and, uh, and American history. And uh, Georges Dorio at Harvard Business School, French and interestingly, who was behind a lot of the start, along with government interventions. So, I mean, I think there is definitely roles, a role for government interventions to do good things in a market economy while leaving those things up to the uh, market actors that should be left up to them, like making shoes and all kinds of things. Uh, also applications uh, for the internet to, uh, to enjoy yourself or to buy and sell um, all kinds of things, including perhaps crypto assets. And we in the European Union and the European Commission, I mentioned we're building a blockchain services infrastructure, which is a little bit like our contribution perhaps to the next generation's internet, but again, just a contribution, just as the internet was invested in by the private sector. And we have, for instance, right now an AI and artificial intelligence blockchain investment fund. It's invested by venture capitalists, private sector venture capitalists out there. It's not us, the civil servants, but we started that out and set out the goal of it, which is to invest in so-called deep tech. We also have a green tech fund coming up, again, going out through private sector venture capitalists, not ourselves, uh, through a conduit, which is known as the European Investment Fund. So I, I would say that there is very much a role for the state, also ensuring fairness, ensuring at some point that those who are excluded from uh, taking part in the market economy because of a lack of education, because of disability, uh, because of other vulnerabilities can, can get in. And in the end, this is also good for the market. It's more consumers, it's more creativity, it's more diverse uh, viewpoints in, in the workforce. The terms that was well defended and that's also why you're here to represent the the public sector in a way. Um, obviously, I, I, I would tend to disagree and would say that uh, the, more you, the more you stay out of the way of entrepreneurs, the better we're off. But I think you, you made a couple of points that, uh, that are pretty uh, good to hear. And you also spoke about uh, being driven by the private enterprise and private incentives. And I think uh, ultimately there's only people, there's no institutions, people, take responsibility for things and people decide for things at an individual level uh, and as a group, uh, which we call institutions, but uh, it, it, it still is, uh, you know, I would say uh, an individual, a family society. And, uh, and so people have to look at each other a little bit like a family and think, okay, what is good for me, but what is also good for my family and the future of, of, of my kids and the kids of my kids and therefore take the right decision in the long term. I think that's where we agree, where we say, you know, uh, regardless of how you want to look at it, um, we still are human beings. And uh, I think the, the positive thing is that if we all come together with the same objective, maybe different angles, but the same objective, and we, call, go, we go at it with, with an honest uh, uh, and meaningful, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, incentive, and, and not only incentive, but also uh, uh, principles and values that we respect. Uh, you talked about the rule of law, I, I agree, uh, provided that it is uh, rules that are agreed by, by most of the people and not uh, a top-down rule imposed then I think we can, but you spoke about big tech and I wanna switch gears a little bit uh, with uh, big data, right? Uh, big data is also something that uh, can be helped. Uh, so here the question is, can big data influence traditional financing patterns? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move back to you, Sabine. Um, do you have an opinion on how uh, the new technology, the, the, the big data uh, can influence those uh, financing patterns? Yes, I like to just go back to standards. So standards are not only state standards, right? There are also industry standards. There are so many different types of standards. And I think it's really also about expectation management. And kind of honestly, I think standards are very necessary and they do come go, feel, uh, go to good outcomes and better outcomes than without. So the market, I would just want to speak about externalities is not necessarily always bringing the optimal outcomes. So I think that's a very different conversation and there's a lot of standards to look at. 
Um, when it comes to big data, I think one of the things for financing that I find very interesting is that we can look at financing decisions in a different way. Um, and we might have different ways of making financing decisions based on standards of any financial institutions or anyone who is providing finance within the rules that are given uh, with uh, standards for financing legal or also company or whatever the standards are. So every institution has its own standards within the framework of the legal standards of a country or the inter international community. Uh, and as such, I think big data allows us to, if we work with uh, real sector companies, allows us to sometimes even go away from financial data and go into real sector data and get early indicators for making financing decisions. And I mean, indicators about production levels, about what are trends before it comes out in financial statements. Financial statements are late indicators, right? There's things have already happened. They need to be documented and they need to be reported and then you, you see it. Uh, if you have operational data, you know what's happening and you know it early on. So I think big data helps us to get access to different types of information uh, that allows us probably to do also different types of financing and to build products and be more innovative in financial product development and work with real sector companies probably in a different way than just through loan financing based on uh, assessing credit worthiness directly through the financials of a company, but uh, doing it all much more into what kind of businesses these companies are involved and in, understanding really early on of how these businesses develop um, and uh, their different ways. I think FinTech platforms, and as I, I talked about trade data, uh, uh, especially specific trade data where you see receivables, I, it's amazing what you can see. And there's much more than that. So there is uh, where you see operational data of co at, at company levels, and if they can be aggregated, um, I think you have a lot more early indicators that allow us to do financing probably in a different way than we've done it in the past. But I think we are at very early stages uh, of that. You spoke about uh, fintech platforms. Uh, what, what, what's the role of fintech platforms in the value chain of connectivity? For me, they're aggregators, they're service providers, right? So they're allowing us to uh, connect different parts in the value chain. And uh, they're, for example, for payments, um, for ordering, uh, they allow us to aggregate the data. So they are the aggregators, they are the service providers to suppliers or to buyers. Um, they allow us to do certain things in a different way. So it's a, it's a tool that is becoming more efficient for what has been done in the past. And on top of that, I think many times it's also much more direct and transparent uh, than going through financial institutions, uh, banks, because it is singular, right? <laughs> it's a singular transaction. It has not multiple products where you do cross-selling. Uh, it's, it's much more direct um, and as such, I think probably more transparent and hopefully cheaper in the end. And anybody else wants to add their, their stone on this? See, I see some reactions. Uh, Michelle or Marie, you wanna? Go ahead, Marie. Yeah, quick unmute. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, I, I agree 100%. And, uh, and definitely with the cheaper. Uh, so uh, how, um, how, how can we deliver these services cheaper to, to people in countries where you know, very often the business rationale might be complicated for a normal bank, so to speak. And uh, the importance of the price, I think cannot be uh, overestimated, right? Because we are uh, primarily talking about people, low-income people. And, uh, and of course, also the remittances. We all know how important remittances are for the families involved. And the price of remittances is a priority uh, for, for many governments uh, and uh, aid organizations and so on. But they, they are still uh, much too high. And smaller amounts, of course, are subjected often to higher percentage costs for transfers. Uh, over 20%, you know, can be charged. Uh, whereas the sustainable development goal has a target of achieving a, a cost of remittances, um, uh, an, an average of 3%. And mobile money, I think, is the closest to this 3% uh, target, uh, because as far as I understand, it's currently about, about 4%. But uh, not only is it very crucially uh, important, of course, to people who are already economically, so economically challenged that they 
uh, are, are, uh, don't have access to banking services. And then finally they can uh, receive or potentially send some money and, uh, and then they are faced with these excruciating costs on small amounts transferred. This uh, also clearly has to change. And uh, for the countries who receive the remittances, sometimes that's up to you know, 10, 30% of GDP of those countries. So uh, we have uh, multiple reasons to support this. And how can we support this without uh, government involvement? Yeah, it, we clearly need uh, state aid. Uh, that's uh, absolutely necessary in my opinion. And my roots are Swedish. So I am proud to say that Sweden is the only country that I am aware of who, uh, whose aid program actually represents more than 1% of their uh, gross uh, national income. <laughs> Seven countries meet the target, which is, uh, I believe, 0.3% uh, or exceed the target. And Sweden is the only one that exceeds 1%. So lots of work for these governments to improve their donor programs. Is Switzerland one of those? Uh, can somebody fact check? <laughs> No fact check, but th thank you, Marie. I think uh, I think you touched on uh, on digital uh, on digital currencies, and I think uh, I, I just want to add um, that also there is an FX uh, cost to it. Uh, yes. Uh, so there, there's not only uh, a, a bank uh, a cost, but then the remittance cost, and then all sorts of things that that could be much more simplified if we were back to the gold standard. In my own opinion, uh, but uh, that that's another that's another topic for another day, I guess. Um, but yes, this this is uh, we we still have twenty minutes, so I'm gonna go uh, to the questions and answers and and let a little bit of room for the public. So as we are going live, please, uh, by all means, uh, uh, put your questions out there. We're going to go through a couple of them. Uh, I can't guarantee we'll go through all of them, but uh, I will start with one here that kind of uh, uh, links uh, all of these. Um, it's a question about, uh, you know, uh, legislators, uh, basically, and, and, and the new technology. And how do you, uh, how do you embed decisions where they are not too cautious so that uh, you kill the innovation, uh, but uh, perhaps uh, that, that's a question also for, for Peter, he says, how do you incentivize legislations uh, to, to see the new technology uh, as an opportunity and not necessarily as a threat? And I'm talking about, uh, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies uh, uh, in this case, uh, we see a, a lot of uh, a lot of concern from different countries who want to ban it altogether, uh, be it because it, it, it threat it, it, they perceive it as a threat to the to the monetary uh, system, or they perceive it as a threat to uh, to to bad financing in their own opinion. Uh, how can you uh, tackle that question, uh, Peteris? Well, thank, thank you very much. This is my, my favorite issue. I could talk on this for much too long for today's conversation, but I'll, I'll try to be short. Um, we utilize, you could say, a three-pronged approach to foster innovation in the European Union. First of all, applying existing legislation, which for most things, the civil law, et cetera, applies. Then secondly, where we have a new technology that is doing something different in a way that hasn't been foreseen by the, techno by the legislation, but is in principle not something either that is prohibited or that anybody intended to prohibit, then we are very much... Uh, using the regulatory sandbox approach, both in multiple member states at the national level. And I have to underline that we have multi-level governance in the EU, so Brussels doesn't dictate things. Um, there are the decisions being taken by subsidiarity uh, closest to the citizen and in the best place for uh, dealing with them, where we have European wide issues like climate change or financial markets, then they are often legislated at the European Union level. So for these new technologies, the regulators, the supervisors working together with the innovators, we will now have a regulatory sandbox for blockchain at the European level with the European blockchain partnership, all the member states. We also have a legislative proposal pilot 
uh, which will roll out uh, distributed ledger technology market infrastructures, again, together with uh, the supervisors and the regulators in a regulatory sandbox plus, it can actually even lift the requirement of a uh, central, centralized securities depository, a CSD. And then finally, when there is something that these previous two uh, approaches cannot address because there really is something new, probably not a technology. We don't regulate technologies as such. We don't have a regulation on servers, a regulation on transistors, a regulation on, on blockchain. Um, we will address the applications of the technology that raise issues, either that we want to enable them and or there are some risk factors that need to be regulated. So to try not to speak too long, an example of this is the markets in crypto assets regulatory proposal, which the College of Commissioners, my politician bosses have adopted, and it's now in the member states and the parliament, the council and the members and the, and the parliament uh, for its final negotiation. And it regulates now all crypto assets, but on a risk-based approach. So the least risky ones, a utility token, which is having an ICO for less than a million euro, you don't even need a white paper. For over a million euro uh, uh, a utility token, white paper submitted to the financial, the home financial regulator, but only if there's a negative reaction, do you have to get something then you have to act vis-a-vis uh, -vis that financial regulator. And then passporting throughout the European Union, the whole single market on the basis of coming out of that one, one member state. And then as you go up to something, let's say a globally significant asset reference token, our legal uh, word for stable coins, this could be something like, let's say, Facebook, uh, Libra Deem, uh, which could be very, very big and then obviously has issues for financial stability, um, for monetary policy. Then this is regulated at a European Union level. And there are more requirements, which obviously a project of that size can also deal with with its lawyers. So, I mean, this is what I would say. This is the philosophy of how we implement a sort of innovation principle in the EU legislative area to enable, foster, and uh, adopt and adapt uh, to the, uh, the new disruptive technologies. Well, thank you. Um, I think you touch on a point that uh, essentially what I'm, what I'm perceiving is that the more systemic the risk is or the more systemic the change is, the more regulation there is. Um, so from, from my perspective, I'm looking at, well, how do you want to change the system if there is increasingly barriers as you go through it? But uh, I, want to, I want to pass on the baton to Michel. Michel, you've heard a lot of things. Uh, what, is, what is your opinion of uh, using both your hats as, uh, as private sector and an academia? What is, the, uh, what is your opinion on, on, uh, on the role of academia to, to be, because I see academia as a little bit of a, of a way to, to, meet, to, to, to discuss with both the private sector and the public sector in order to kind of uh, form uh, an informed opinion about mm. what it is that we should be doing. Yes. Well, academia as well, academic world is, is uh, ideally situated to, to uh, kind of uh, look at what's happening in in the real practical uh, world of practitioners, private sector, and also the public sector, and make an analysis of both. And in, in the field of, of our dis discussion, um, and referring to what Terry said about this link between what's happening in the digital world and the rule to, to regulate that, especially when we're talking about um, uh, digital digitalization performed by uh, private actors. Um, I'm looking very closely now at what's happening from central banks and uh, central banks also going digital. So we're talking here about CBDC, so central bank digital currencies. We've had one example in China. Uh, the, the first one was actually uh, Sweden. We discussed, we talked about Sweden with Marie and Sweden has had a, also, a, <laughs> was the only central bank, it's the, actually the oldest uh, uh, central bank, 1632 or something. 
Uh, so, and there was also the first central bank to consider going digital and creating a digital krona. Um, now, I personally like central banks, although I can be critical of central banks in their actions and saying that they're not doing enough. For instance, I believe that they could do more to enhance stability. There is uh, mentioned twice the word stability uh, this evening, a financial system. I'm a big fan of that. And I believe that central banks do a mistake. They, uh, they, uh, only, they ref um, refrain from acting before a, a bubble bursts in financial markets, and they only act thereafter, injecting huge, massive liquidity, as they're doing now. I believe they should be more active before and I, when, I, when there is the bubble in information and, and, uh, and try to uh, make uh, with higher interest rates, tight, tighter liquidity conditions, uh, um, uh, prevent that bubble to become too massive and hence get a bigger recession thereafter. So I actually like CBDCs. I like central banks keeping in control. Reason number one is I believe we cannot let private sector actors guiding the stability of the whole system. There's no incentive for a Facebook with the Libra or the new currency coming thereafter that at some point it refrains from, because it says, oh my God, the whole thing system is going to crash. So. Uh, you know, they're just there to make money. So, and the central bank is not there out there to make money. It's out also out there to stabilize uh, the system. So, st uh, and right now, they're also playing a major role in keeping the whole system sustainable. Debt is increasing. I mentioned when I introduced myself that I'm doing some analysis now on debt sustainability. Uh, Debt is increasing, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> it's going through the roof. Uh, you know, you look at Greece, you look at Japan, they have debt to GDP levels above 200%. The whole th system can remain sustainable and stable if uh, interest rates remain low. And here is where central banks play a major role. If you remove all this and you leave currencies become fully digital by private sector actors, you can no longer have that kind of sustainability. Uh, and the third reasons of why I like central banks also to remain in control is that I actually don't mind if the Riksbank, the central bank of Sweden, keeps a track through a digital corona of all the drinks I have from early morning to early mornings the next day, <laughs> coffee from the first coffee to the last cocktail. Uh, I'm not sure I have, you know, I may have issues with privacy and, uh, you know, with letting all my transactions be monitored by some uh, private sector uh, firm <laughs> that I don't know what it does with, with my, my data. Michel, thank you. I have three things of why I am critical of central banks. First of all, a lot of those central banks are actually private banks. They are privately owned, uh, like the Swiss National Bank that is even quoted in the stock exchange and they are conducting private, uh, it's just that they have a mandate. Uh, so this is the, the, the first one. So I don't know if there's a thin line there that, uh, that has to be seen somewhat. Uh, the second one is that uh, I believe they're too active before and after, and particularly before, because maybe in my opinion, a lot of those bubbles are created precisely from central banks and from the too low of an interest rate and maybe even breach of mandates by engaging in activities that distort price discovery by buying assets uh, on, on the curve of the bond yield or buying assets outright on the equity markets. I think there is reasons to be critical of that. And I think even themselves recognize that in some way. Mm. Uh, the, 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 third, the, the third has more to do with the principle of a central banking system where it hasn't always been there. And uh, I do not know if it's consistent with, uh, are we in a free market or are we not? Because if we are, then why is it that the price of money, the price of interest rates essentially is not decided by the market, but rather by dictate of, uh, of central bankers. So I think a, a lot of 
my libertarian friends would agree with those statements. Uh, I guess this is a debate for a long, long conversation. So I'm gonna get myself out of this by going to a question from the public, which is how can we more uh, broadly speaking as citizens support uh, financial inclusion and developing countries. So I, I'd like to take a round table here uh, about what is it that we as individuals and the listeners as well, uh, what is it that we can do at the personal level uh, or whatever the degree of influence we have over institutions to, to increase that uh, common goal at the end of the day that we have of inclusive and transparent financial systems. Uh, so I'll uh, give it back to uh, Marie. Um, Uh, thank you. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, <clears throat> the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the world's largest foundation and they have a very big program in favor of financial inclusion. And uh, so, you know, that's one avenue. Give money to, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You can, uh, uh, there are many organizations that work uh, in favor of financial inclusion and I actually, you know, don't necessarily know um, how to distinguish between all of them, but there's a financial alliance for women. There's a women's uh, world banking center for financial inclusion. Uh, you know, Google it. And I'm sure there are very many organizations very worthy of your participation and your time should uh, you have that uh, to give. And, um, and uh, otherwise, uh, of course, it's uh, just uh, really, really difficult to, to be hands-on unless um, you happen to be in a role uh, more like Sabine's perhaps where you actually have uh, the opportunity to, to, to channel funds in favor of such projects. And uh, if anybody wants to brainstorm after this event, uh, definitely open for, uh, for further conversations on that score. <laughs> Thank you, Sabine. I think it's a very different, difficult question to ask it individually, right? I think we have all have common objectives and we work on it with very many different tools uh, and financial inclusion is one of them. Uh, and you have many different avenues to get there. Um, I think individually as a consumer or as someone who works and is part of, or is in a, in a society, I think we all have our opinions of how we get there. Um, I think being part of an organization like the World Bank Group, we have probably better tools at hand and how we can support uh, existing trends and how we can come to decisions of what we want to do and what we don't want to do. We work with many stakeholders. We, we have a platform that uh, allows us to probably be, uh, uh, be heard uh, and, and, and have more influence, right? It's about influence. And, and I, think that's, it's, uh, I think that's a very important part of how you can participate. But I think everyone is a leader and everyone can do what is within their frame and you have to look for yourself of how you want to support and what your sphere of influence is. I would not like to discourage anyone to participate in greater transparency by just being aware of what's happening and asking a little bit of question of, is this the story I want to listen to or is there something else behind it? And uh, yeah, just ask a bit more questions and look behind the scenes of what really is happening. So that is, but that's an opinion and uh, I think we all have to uh, approach it individually. I agree with that, Pateris. I mean, I think we're coming to the end, so I'll try to say in maybe three phrases, um, development funding. I think uh, we should be contributing uh, to multilateral institutions and to developing countries themselves, uh, sharing technology, technology transfer, and the benefits of innovation and then also being open in ed education and exchange between the universities, both on technological issues, as well as on policy rule of law issues. And in this way, we can move forward to getting more people uh, financially included and more parts of the world thriving, both socially and economically. Thank you very much, Michel, go ahead. Um, yes, well, I'm in a university, so what else? And then talk about education and the big value added of, uh, of today's technology. Uh, you know, uh, 
MOOCs, massive open online courses. We've done a series. Uh, there are other providers also on platforms like Coursera. Uh, we, we have a program there, 20 hours of videos, and we're going to reach just maybe as I speak, <laughs> 1, million, 1 million students throughout the world have been following these courses. Many of them are in developing countries like Africa uh, and other emerging markets. Uh, and, and in there, we talk about uh, investments, financial markets, uh, digital trends, what is blockchain, how it can be used. And, uh, and basically to access it, you just need a, a phone and, and some Wi-Fi. Yeah, I, 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 thank you. And it's the, the content is free of charge. So I'm a great believer in those, um, in those massive uh, online courses. So first of all, I would like to say thank you for everybody because I think uh, this is also some, somewhat what, what I'm trying to reach uh, uh, by having a lot of opinions and basically sharing those ideas with, uh, with the viewers. Uh, and I, in my opinion, I like to quote a lot Milton Friedman when he says that people vote with their feet and they vote with their wallet. And uh, sometimes people underestimate what voting with your feet means, which is not only putting the money where your mouth is or, or buying the products for which you do a little bit more research about and support that, those private initiatives, but then also spend some time and energy. Uh, we don't have to undervalue the amount of time and energy that people can do. One hour every week over a course of a year, uh, engage in the things that you really believe in at any level. Uh, if you want to support uh, uh, financial inclusion and transparency, uh, you can spend uh, that time and energy and volunteer in so many organizations. Uh, that's, that's one of the things I think uh, uh, people can definitely do because you don't need anything, but just, you, just, just what you have uh, uh, being given by, uh, by God's given names, right? So um, I, I, would like, uh, I would like to close this and now with one minute delay, we're gonna try to do it a little bit like Swiss time, but uh, uh, thank you everybody. Uh, maybe uh, stepping uh, the boundaries, one last sentence uh, you would like to share. Uh, starting with Sabine. Uh, I think there is a lot more and the financial sector for me is a tool. Financial transparency is a tool to an end and the end has to be prosperity uh, and erosion of poverty. That is? Innovation for empowering the individual citizen. Marie? I'll repeat myself, cheaper, better, faster. And finally, Michel. I like this quote from Christine Lagarde. And uh, for me, it's a fantastic thing to say. If Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Sisters, <laughs> the world would not be in such a mess. Oh, <laughs> beautiful quote. I, I have nothing to add to that. I would just say thank you for everybody. Uh, I hope you, you all uh, can feel that uh, being grateful is the first step and then try to figure out how you can move ahead with what you have, uh, regardless of who you are, regardless of where you are, or ethnicity, race, and religion. Um, I hope to see you soon again. And um, don't hesitate to comment, uh, subscribe, and then follow us and support this, uh, this movement as well. And we'll all individually and as a group try to move forward for... Uh, pushing the agenda of the financial future we want for more inclusiveness, more transparency. And if we all join, uh, even if we can disagree on certain things, if we have the same objective and good brains, we will get there. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.